We will call this meeting of the North City Council Finance Committee to order. Um, I do want to welcome um, everyone to our meeting. So if you can, and actually, since we do have a large attendance, if there are members of council that want to take their regular seats tonight and free up a seat for someone else, you know, feel free to do so. I think that might help with some of the people standing in the back. Um, and you might be a little more comfortable with the discussions and whatnot. Um, for those of you that are, uh, this is your first time visiting a Monday night for committees, uh, we do have, there's four committees that are meeting tonight. And so I'm the chair of finance, and so we'll go through our business with the finance committee agenda, and then the next committee will occur. And so you'll see different people taking this chair um, as the chair of their committee. And so just in case you say, why are these people rotating around, that's, uh, that's how we usually do things in committee. So. Um, I just want to remind people that uh, I will read the title of the legislation and then we will have a testimony from the administration and then we'll have questions from the committee members and then uh, from members of council and then we'll open it up for questions from uh, the audience. Um, the Finance Committee does have two pieces of legislation and our first uh, piece of legislation is consider resolution number 1507, appropriating monies for the current expenses of the municipal corporation. And section one is appropriating, is a request for appropriation of $81,980.81. And I'll see that our city engineer, Mr. Moorhead, is at the podium. Yes, sir. I will uh, try to replace Roger Loomis, but we know he's not re replaceable, so I'll fill in as best as I can for him. Uh, the first item under section one is a, uh, it, it comes from the $4.6 million worth of bond money that was borrowed back in 2012. And um, that money was all borrowed uh, for several different projects. Now this is basically, those projects are completed and actually section one and section two go, go along with this. He's now just moving the money uh, into the correct accounts to balance what the money was actually used on, whether it be stormwater, water, or sanitary sewer. Motion. I'll make a motion. Motion, Mr. Marmy. Second, Second Mr. Bob. Uh, any questions from the committee regarding this request? Any questions from the audience? One, one item that I, I don't know if it showed up on your uh, on the piece of legislation. There was a typo on uh, the account number. The, the first three digits should be 623. I don't know if it shows up as 632. Uh, it is 623. Okay, yep. 623 is the correct, the correct number. And then uh, uh, it, I think the 632 showed up on the uh, finance committee request also. But the correct number is 623. Well, I, um, I guess I can probably email Mr. Loomis about this, but this is under the water pressure zone project, is that correct? As it's categorized? Um, it is the uh, WWR, it's the wastewater replacement fund. And this is... Uh, we did several projects under this. We did uh, water line, actually water line replacements and, and uh, up in the Howe and Harlech area. We did um, some work on Yorkshire Drive, also some water line replacement. We had included in that $4.6 million bond storm sewer project on Mao and King. Uh, and all those projects had both, you know, the Mao and King project, although it was pro primarily storm sewer. There was a little bit of water work that, that needed to play, take place there, and there was also some storm, some sanitary sewer work. So when you get to the end of the project, he wanted to account for uh, the work items with the funding sources being in the appropriate places. Uh, any further questions or comments from the committee? All in favor of moving Section 1 on the full council signify by saying aye. 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 Close same sign. Section one carries five zero. Uh, section two is the Mr. Moorhead sort of talk about talk about these in the emergency, but um, section two is for the per request of perfect sixteen thousand nine hundred and fifteen dollars. 
correct. It's a, the same same issue. It's to uh, replenish the six two one fund, which is a water fund. Make motion. Motion, Mr. Marmy. Second, Mr. Bob. Uh, any questions from the committee? Questions from the audience. All those in favor of moving section two onto full council signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Motion carries up five zero. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moorhead. Um, section three is to appropriate thirteen hundred dollars from the unappropriate balance of the general fund and it's for the for building grounds and maintenance. So I see Director Rhodes is up to Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is the third year in a row we've been fortunate enough to receive an anonymous donation. And uh, we're just asking to appropriate the $1,300. Again, it was a donation. And again, it will be used for uh, flowers around the courthouse gazebo. Motion. <coughs> Let's go with the cost employed this time. Uh, any questions from the committee? <coughs> questions from the audience? Nobody wants questions about flowers? <laughs> All, right. All those in favor, move this on to full council. Since by the same aye. 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 Post same sign. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rhodes. Mm -hmm. uh, section 4 is a uh, request for $72,000 for the sewer project, from the sewer project fund. And I see our city engineer, Brian Moorhead, at the podium. <coughs> Uh, yes, these are uh, these are both actually memo appropriations. They are part of the WPCLF loan that uh, was taken out for the aeration project at the wastewater plant and the Raccoon Creek interceptor project. Uh, Roger was hoping that the projects were going to be completed uh, and all the paperwork cleared up by the end of last year. Uh, but a couple things hung out there, so he didn't put these appropriations in the first piece of the legislation at the beginning of the of the year. So hence, we have to go back and reappropriate these uh, memo amounts to balance out with the loan amounts. Any questions from the committee? Motion. Motion, okay. Mr. Marmy. Uh, any questions or comments? Questions, comments from the audience. All those members in favor of moving this on to full council, signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Motion carries 5 0. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next piece of legislation for Finance Committee is to consider resolution number 1508, appropriating monies for the current expenses of the municipal corporation. And this piece of legislation um, has just one section dealing with an employee. Uh, good evening, uh, council members. Uh, this is um, Chad Smith. He resigned on December 12th, and this is his comp and vacation payout. Motion. Second. Motion, Mr. Bob. Second, Mr. F Mrs. Floyd. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Questions or comments from the audience? All those in favor, move this on to full council. Signify by saying aye. 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 Put the same sign. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Your time. That concludes the business of the Finance Committee. And the next committee up is um, Capital Improvements. Uh, Capital Improvements Committee to order, please. Present. Mr. Roletta. Mr. Rao, Mr. Class, myself, and Mr. Johnson. Resolution number 1509, appropriating monies for the current expenses of the municipal corporation. We have three sections. Section number one is hereby an appropriation of the unappropriated balance of the, of the 335 capital improvement fund in the amount of $32,000 in placement of warrant equipment. And, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what we have here is zero-turn mowers. We're going to replace three of them at the parks and cemetery, as well as uh, ten uh, echo weed eaters. These items are being bought locally. <coughs> and, uh, it'll replace worn-out equipment. Put us in uh, good shape for the beginning of the uh, season. Motion. Is there a motion? Yes. Motion. Second. Mr. Rao. Second. Mr. Johnson. Motion carries 
second. Any questions of committee? Questions in the audience? Mr. Marley? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, when can we expect to see a capital improvements plan or capital improvements budget so we can see you know, how this all fits into the plan for the year? Uh, Doug, I'll have one to you by the end of the week. Great. Any other questions? All those in favor of moving to a question? Yes. question. Here's another question. What do you do with the used? Could you, could you step up, please? Could you come up, please? Uh, That'll put it in the <laughs> We need your name and address, please. Yeah. Just for the record. Thanks. Sandra Spencer, uh, 253 Park Trails Court, Newark. I was just curious what they did with the equipment that's going to be replaced. Yeah. Okay. Just Depending on the uh, piece of equipment that's being replaced, we, we sometimes sell them and we sometimes keep them as backup. So it just depends. Okay, any other questions? Okay. All those in favor of the Council? Aye. Uh, All those opposed, uh, same sign. Yes, one. Section 2. There's hereby an appropriation of the unappropriated balance. <coughs> 335 capital improvement amount 13500 uh, purchase of two motor two mowers and two pumps for Hollander pool yes these are the motors and the pumps that run the circulation system of the pool at the end of next last year we took a good look at them and it was determined that they were uh, old and outdated and that they needed to be replaced so we're just updating that any, any questions from the council? Committee? The audience? Any motion? Motion. Second. Those in favor of passing the full council? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Same sign? <coughs> Section 3. <coughs> There's hereby an appropriation of the unappropriate balance of 335 capital improvement fund in the amount of 46,000 for <coughs> vehicles for uh, the New York uh, Fire Department. Thank you. Uh, this is to replace one of the battalion vehicles. Uh, they, they are a first responder. Uh, the assistant chief would generally drive this vehicle. Uh, the one that they're currently driving has 212,000 miles on it, and it needs to be replaced. How many miles? 212,000. Well, this is a new vehicle. Yeah, it's a new vehicle. Bought locally. Uh, questions from the committee? <coughs> what, what type of vehicle are we talking about? Well, it'll be a, um, I don't, I'm not going to say a suburban, but a smaller car. like Not not like a Jeep, but a compact car like that. Questions from the audience? Is there a motion? Motion. Second. Any other questions? In favor of passing the full council? Aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Passes is five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next, uh, we have personnel committee. Okay, I'll call the personnel committee to order. Um, members present are Bub, Marmy, Guthrie, Roletta, and Floyd. Um, we only have one. We have one item tonight. Ordinance 15-5, amending the position authorization tables of the City of Newark Department of Public Safety Division of Police, reducing the position of captain by one through attrition, resulting in a strength authorization of three. Uh, Director Spurgeon, I think, is out there somewhere.
Good evening, Madam Chair. Peace before you tonight. Ask permission from Council to rearrange how we're deploying our staff in the police department. We currently have a uh, authorization of four captains. I'd like to reduce that by one with the intention of adding another street officer. Okay. Are there questions of the committee? I know there's some questions I've heard about. So. Mr. McGuthrie. Um, Madam Chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Spurgeon, the, uh, you indicated uh, with the intention of adding a street officer. Can you talk to us about the timetable and is adding that street officer uh, going to um, uh, replace simply the slot of the captain or is it going to replace the vac vacancies created by retirements last year uh, or any other pending retirements for 2015? My intention can only be to add an officer. Speaking of who's left, who's going to leave, those all have budget restrictions. What I'd like to do is free up salary money so I can attempt to add some more people. Um, uh, Madam Chair, um, I believe that, um, and, and maybe you can expand on this. I believe that council appropriated funds for officers for this year. Um, and um, I don't, it seems to me the appropriation went beyond the current level, level of strength. Can you comment on that? Uh, for the details, I've asked Chief Sarver to be here. What I can tell you, Mark, is we have given a test. We are processing candidates, and the chief has told me that there's one in particular he'd offer this month for me to consider. Um, but, uh, Madam Chair, again, Bill, my, um, what I'm trying to get at here, because, you know, we, we do these personnel issues during the year, and we appro appropriate X number of dollars to cover X number of slots. In the appropriation for 2015, were there only funds to cover the slots that are currently filled, or were there some funds in there for vacancies that resulted last year? I would defer to our chief on that, Mark. I just I don't have those numbers memorized. Are there any other questions of Mr. Spurgeon at this point? Okay, Chief Sarvi. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Guthrie, what is it you specifically want me to answer? When council appropriates funds for the departments, um, the request generally is for filling X number of slots. I'd like to know if the funds that were appropriated for 2015, if all of the slots that those funds were appropriated for are currently filled or if there are currently some vacancies for the funds that we appropriated for 2015. We started 2015 off with money allocated for 70 sworn positions. We're currently sitting on 69. We gave a test and we're in the background investigation stage now of selecting who it is that we would like to be our 70th police officer. We only have seven candidates that are in the running. Some of them already have OPATA certification, some don't. So that will make a difference somewhat in who we select as to whether or not they'll have to go to an academy or not. Nonetheless, we're, we're actively looking for that 70th person. In either mid-March or early April of 2015, Sergeant Paul Davis has indicated that he plans to retire. That put us right back at 69 again. On March 6th of this year, whether this council is aware of it or not, I will retire from the police division. That will put us at 68 people. So we still are trying to fill those two positions, three total, to get up to 70. Realizing that money today, 2015, hasn't been what it has been for the past couple of years, and looking towards 2016, the goal that the safety director is trying to achieve, and I'm certainly not putting words in his mouth, 
is if we eliminate a captain's position that may not be deemed as necessary and to be able to use those funds, the salary and benefits that go with it, to be able to ensure that we continue with 70 police officers or perhaps even 71 in 2016. That's the purpose of that money. What the union will tell you is that there's no guarantee that that, let's say, $100,000 would be used for a police officer. And the safety director has confided in me that as long as the funds are the same in 2016 that they are in 2015, that money would be used for an additional police spot. Should the mayor or the auditor's office, the powers to be, if you will, that says in 2016, we gotta take $100,000 from you, then that money's not gonna be there for that extra police officer, but now we're still going to have a captain sitting there pulling in about $100,000, and I'm here prepared to tell you that this police division and losing a number of people that we have, we're at the level that that fourth captain's position is not that important. And let me just give you a little historical overview, if I may, without going too far into this. Way back in 1972, that's the easiest, the further back I can see, this police division had one chief, four captains, and X amount of sergeants. In 2007, I was hired in December. There was one chief, four captains, and 11 sergeants. In 2015, we have lost 12 people that we had in 2010, from 81 officers down to 69. We still have one chief, four captains, and 11 sergeants. We have 12 less police officers. What we're trying to do, what the safety director is trying to do, is take some of the administrative, and I'll call it fat, and put it down on the street where we really believe the citizens of Newark is going to get their best bang for their buck. That's the purpose of this. Of the four captains, we have a patrol captain who does, I won't say he in particular, but that bureau does about 75% of the work. That's the police cars on the street, responding to calls for service, we have a detective bureau commander that oversees a detective bureau. They follow up investigating serious reported crimes. And then the other two bureaus, one is the administrative bureau who oversees the budget, the day-to-day -day paying of bills, fleet maintenance. That's one captain and one sergeant and one mechanic in an entire bureau. The fourth bureau is a support bureau. That's a captain with two sergeants. They oversee training, accreditation, this, uh, records and communication service quite a, a, a decent amount of work. If this police division was reduced from four captains to three captains, the work that the administrative captain does, the budget, annual budget, could be shifted to the police chief. When I took over in 2007, Daryl Pennington reviewed the budget and certainly had input, but his administrative, administrative captain was really the workhorse to put all the pieces in place, and the chief reviewed it and approved it. That's continued. I allow that captain to pretty much say where do we got to plug by looking at a historical overview of the last three or five years to see where money is necessary. And if we lose money, where we have to lose that from. That position could be combined with the Support Services Bureau commander with a little bit of those tasks given off to other people. The goal here being that the $100,000 freed up from that captain's position would be put at the line level so that we continue to have as many police officers on the street as possible. If the budget goes any more downhill in 2016, this department's going to go down to 68, 69, maybe even 66 police officers. And I'm here to tell you that that can't happen. This city is busy enough and has enough crime. You've heard me say before at this podium, this is a very safe city, and I thoroughly believe that. But we do have crime, and we do have services we provide to the citizens that have to continue. And we can't keep losing the boots on the street. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I've actually got some more questions, and I, um, I don't know whether uh, Bill or Chief, uh, you want to answer this, but it, it sounds to me, Bill, that when you make a commitment to add an officer, basically all you're doing is filling a slot that this council appropriated for an officer because um, uh, we are down to 69 and we appropriated to 70. So the result of this action that is being requested is not going to result in an extra two boots on the street. 
because we appropriated to get to 70. Am I wrong? I would tend to disagree, sir. We, with the chief, you've heard the chief and myself both say that we are processing applicants, and this action that we're asking permission for is to enhance our ability to provide for police officers. And, and that, but you just said you wanted to hire an additional officer, correct? I said it's my intention to okay. use that money to hire an officer, absolutely. Okay, but what about the money we appropriate? If we've appropriated for 70 officers, and you have 69. What about that that slot that we appropriated money for? We've testified we're attempting to fill that. So then your commitment then is to hire two officers <coughs> or one officer? Because if you only hire if your commitment's only to hire one, all you're doing is fulfilling council's appropriation. But if you're gonna hire two, you're going a step further and you're hiring an officer as a result of council eliminating that captain's position. I won't debate the numbers with you. What I will do is publicly tell you that my intention is to use those salaries for a captain to provide an officer, a street well, officer. I, and I, I respect that, but that's not good enough for me. I, I'm just tired of sitting up here and voting for changes and tables of organization, and then the end result is we don't see more boots on the street. That I, you know, I respect everybody else's opinion on it, but that's mine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Director, <clears throat> Chief, if I hear you correctly, there is one in the pipeline which the salary is already allocated for. By eliminating this tonight, that is going to give us or give the city the ability to hire an additional one, maybe two down the road. Correct after retirement would occur this spring? My answer to that, Brian, would be I can't forecast the future on budgetary allotments, rising expenses, but as I stand here today in front of this council, that is the intent of this permission we seek. Is to We'd like to use those monies to put some more badges on the ground. Are there any other questions of the committee for either Chief Sarver or Mr. Spurgeon at this point? Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to pass this on to the full council. Okay. There's my vote. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, second by Martin. I understand, I know there's some police officers here. Is there somebody else you'd like to speak? I've, go got, another, I've got another question. For? Uh, safety Director or Okay, okay, Chief. all right. Um, Just a minute, yeah, go ahead. Bill. Anyway, excuse me just a second. I'd like to know, um, Bill, uh, do we have some other vacancies? For instance, do we have a chemist position vacant? Do we have a, a public safety officer position vacant? We do. And are those going to be filled? We are reviewing that internally at this time. And we appropriated funds for those positions? You did. We've, we've lost the chemist and the manner which we've lost the chemist that we had trained brings me some questions before we go down that road again. The public safety officer, again, I would defer to Chief Sarver, but I believe there's a commitment. Somebody's bid on it, been awarded, um, but I don't want to testify to that because he knows better than I. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Would you give your name and address, please, for the record? I will. My name is Jay McDonald. I'm president of the Fraternal Order of Police of Ohio. I'm a Marion police officer. Um, I'm honored to stand before you today, Madam Chair. I'm here today to ask you to slow down. This is an issue that deserves debate and study. Nobody wants more officers on the ground more than the officers you already have. But this is an issue that the administration told the officers that you have that they want to talk to them about it after the budget. That talk has still not happened. There's no reason to rush. The question I think would have been better phrased for the safety director is, would this move get you from 70 to 71? The answer as I understood it from the back of the room is no. The allocation of the officers you currently have, no matter what their rank, is the job of the, of the administration. So to say that you have too many chiefs and not enough Indians, 
Well, that's maybe they they could be deployed differently to accomplish the goals that you'd want to accomplish. I'd also argue the fact is you have the right number of chiefs, you just don't have enough Indians. In 1993, you had less officers than you had now, and you had a chief and four captains. All this time later, you have a chief and four captains. This department, you heard the chief testify in 1972, you had a chief and four captains. Obviously, there has been a need for a chief and four captains since 1972. Otherwise, this move, this discussion, this debate should have happened much, much earlier. You have allocated the resources for 70 officers. Listen to what they didn't tell you. They didn't tell you we were going to 71 if you do this. They said we're going to hire somebody. That gets you to 70, what you've already paid for. I think the most prudent action is to slow down and wait. What could not be improved by a discussion amongst the interested parties? Perhaps there could be a solution that is mutually beneficial to the mayor and the safety director and to the officers who swore an oath to protect this community. Let's have the discussion. I commit to you that the officers who serve you right now are willing to have that discussion. They're waiting to have that discussion. They deserve to have that discussion. Let's wait. No reason to make this move right this second. This is the reason you have committees at council. It's the reason you have committees at the state legislature and in Congress is to debate important issues. This is an issue that deserves more than five minutes at one committee. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions, Madam Chair. Any members of the committee have a question? Any other members of council have questions? I have a question. Yes. Okay. Um, the last time we waited, it was with the fire department, and we were criticized and uh, condemned that we didn't act sooner that we waited until the actual retirement took place. Um, you indicated that we do have enough chiefs, but not enough Indians. Um, how would you propose that this city and the budget crisis that we're in pay for more Indians? Well, I've actually had that discussion with, with, uh, with the mayor. Um, I'm not an expert in your finances. What I am is a 22-year-old or 22-year law enforcement veteran who know what kind of people you need to deliver the services you've been delivering. And as budgets shrink through cuts in local government funding and other factors that come down from Columbus that impact you and everybody else in this state, I understand what those have done to local budgets. But I will also tell you that the allocation of resources is a management issue. I am a major, which would be an equivalent to a captain in this police department in Marion. I answer calls, I write reports, I investigate calls. It happens all over the state. It could happen here as well. So what's, what's your solution for additional funds? I didn't hear. Well, the first solution is to stand up and fight against cuts in local government funding. Not just some of us, but all of us need to make that fight. Uh, now's the time when the state is con contemplating a budget coming up. It's time for all of us, regardless of what letter comes after our name, to stand up because the most essential services are the ones that are provided locally. Police, fire, EMS, roads, those are local, locally funded services and they're the most important services and, we, and local government should not be shrifted by the state government. As far as what you could do and how you could better spend your resources, you know that better than I do. I don't know the answer to where there's a nickel here and a nickel there. Okay, the other comment... Um uh, the safety director has indicated that it is his intention uh, to get to more badges on the street, uh, basically. Uh, we have the positions available, so what is it that you would want? And, and he's actually doing a good job of saying, 
Um, we don't know what's going to come about in 2016. So if I sit here and I guarantee something that I cannot deliver on, then I am not a, a, a truly responsible uh, leader. And all I'm trying to do is get to where there are more police officers. Now, if we don't act upon this, and then the funding shrinks even further, we're going to end up with even less badges on the street because through, if there is layoffs or anything of that magnitude, then it comes from the lower ranks and because of the, just the, the time. Or we have to demote if we remove a position then. Then you move a captain down to a sergeant uh, and they're actually demoted. And you know that depletes morale. So I guess what is what is the harm in moving forward with this when we know that there is um, someone who is retiring, and we're trying to do this through attrition, and we're trying to put money. Not only that, this council is the only body that can move those personnel costs into any other item other than personnel costs, as far as salaries and benefits. So as far as checks and balances and checking the safety director, this council has the checks and balances on that and ensuring that those funds go towards personnel costs. Okay. Well, you've asked me a couple different things. There is no one who can stand up here and predict 2016. There is myself, you, the safety director, nobody. But the question was asked, by the elimination of the captain's job, where, what are you going to do with the money? And the answer was never given that we were going to get to 71. The answer is, is we're going to try to hire somebody. You have already put money in the budget. You have already said we are going to get to 70. So if the answer is we are going to go to 71 with this move, that, that would, the officers would like to hear that. Because they've got the answer when they've asked, can't promise you anything. Well, that's easy to say. I can't promise you anything. If every business closed up in town today, you wouldn't have 70. If Whirlpool leaves Marion, we wouldn't have what we have. But you can't, you can't run a city like that. What you have to do is you've budgeted for 70. I think you, this council has said you want 70. You have the apparatus in front of you right now to, do, to go to 70. Doing this job doesn't, doing this move doesn't get you to 70. You've already paid for that. Okay, then let me follow up. Uh, Director Spurgeon, is it your goal to get the police force to a higher number, your goal to get the police force to a higher number than what it currently stands? Yes, it is. As a matter of record, and I can appreciate our friends in labor's passion, it's not lost on me. It's just going to affect some sergeants, some good sergeants, and I'm not lost on that. But I did sit down with our friends in labor. And I am giving you my assurance that that is the intent of this. But I won't begrudge you with all the, the dynamics, uh, ACA, rising costs. That I just can't sit here and say 71 is a number. Vote for this and I'll give it to you. I would not be responsible. Our friend in labor has said we can't predict a future. But what I can tell you, it is my intent to put more badges on the ground. And that's what this piece seeks to do. A follow-up. If we don't go this way and the things that you just indicated happen, what could be the result in that? How many then would we have? If we don't go this direction, then when we have some retirements, and the chief has now publicly stated his intention, I will be required to fill those positions. And then I am at the mercy of an uncertain economy. And I don't, I don't know what staffing will look like next year, but you have heard our chief's testimony. We can't take another cut. And so I've got to get creative, and I'm not going to... I do think it's a way to manage a city. I think it's a way to look forward, what are the threats out there, and our threat is financial. And I'm trying to free up some bucks to put some badges on the ground because that today is where they're needed. Our people are getting ran ragged. Well, um, um, if I could, Bill, um, it's only been a month since this council did the appropriation for 2015. Mm -hmm. 
That appropriation with 70 officers was, in essence, brought to us by the administration. Mm -hmm. Basically, what I'm asking is fulfill that good faith commitment that council made to get to 70 because that's what we appropriated for and then give us one more officer as a result of council agreeing to to eliminate the captain. That's all I'm asking for. And, and that is my intent. Madam Chair, may I ask a, a good lawmaker a question? Yes. What would you have me do if seven people on this list are unqualified to be hired here? And I can't I can't process another list this year. That's just one contingency. So I'm not going to come, come up here in this number. But all I can tell you is I can look you in the eye and tell you what my intention is to add an additional officer with these monies. But there are things out there that I can't possibly put put my word on, and, and, I, and I won't. So, um, Madam Chairman, Bill, are you saying that the only thing holding you back, the only thing holding you back from going to 71 if we approve this legislation is having a, two viable people on that list, is that the only thing holding you back? Today, that is what I'm telling you. And our chief is processing that list as we speak. So and it was if there are one... two viable candidates on that list, and we approve this legislation tonight, you are going to hire two officers. That would be my intention. I would ask Chief Sarver if he could make that happen. I can't. There is a process. But that would be my intention. We are spending X number of dollars in fiscal year 15 for this management position. Let's take those and get another officer on, uh, at the street level. That is my intention. Are there any other questions of the committee, first of all? <clears throat> of any other council member? Yeah, Mr. Gunn? Um, if I may ask the Chief a quick question, just want to follow up on a comment you uh, stated. Uh, one of the, um, the captains stated that um, his duties could be absorbed by the, the police chief. Was that correct? Well, one of the functions of the administrative bureau commander is preparation for the annual budget. All four captains, as you're well aware, were an accredited agency. Part of accreditation requires that all four bureau commanders have input into the budget. We review all that. The Administrative Bureau Captain gives me his recommendations as far as what should go into each budget, each line item, whether it's vehicles this year, whether it's or not necessary vehicles, that's capital improvement, whether it's salary, whether it's computers, whatever the case might be, training, and then ultimately the police chief makes that final decision. The budget preparation itself could be done 100% by the police chief and not by a bureau commander. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask the chief? Yes. Uh, chief. I think that um, Director Spurgeon um, sort of passed the ball to you there, um, and I, I'd like to know your opinion on uh, if, if we have two viable candidates on the list, is it your recommendation to the administration to get to 71 officers this year? Yes, sir. Now, please keep in mind, what we, when I say we, the administration and the command staff, myself, the police chief, our biggest fear is council approves doing away with the captain's position. We have two viable candidates, one to fill the current vacancy and one that would be the money used for the captain's money. And then in 2016, the mayor, with approval of council, says we've got to give you $100,000 less. If nobody retires in that time period, we would have to lay somebody off. Having said that, if you don't appropriate the money for a police officer versus a captain and the budget stays the same, we're not going to be able to hire that person to even get there. And then if money is less in 2016, now you're talking about people being pulled away. Now we all know through attrition, generally speaking, it sometimes balances out. We don't have to lay anybody off because we two people retire. In 2014, we lost one police officer through retirement and one through resignation, just two. In 2015, looking forward, myself and Paul Davis are the only ones that have publicly said we plan on going. 
So you may lose two people. And if those people aren't replaced this year, then in 2016, if the money is less, it's going to balance out. You won't have to lay anybody off. So the goal being, as the safety director said, <clears throat> is to take this $100,000, we're just using it as a figure, salary plus benefits, $100,000, fill our current position that council authorized, and then add that 71st position minus one captain's position. Now, keep in mind, you're not really getting a 71st person because that captain is being removed from the equation and you're replacing it with a police officer. You're getting more people on the street. It doesn't increase the numbers. The captain goes away. Hypothetically, we're at 70. Nice, easy numbers. We're at 70. Council approves removing a captain. We're at 69. We hire somebody with the money from the captain's salary. You're back at 70. So you're not really getting to 71. Theoretically, you can say, okay, we're going to add another body, which we are. It doesn't increase the numbers because you have one captain less. What it does is puts more people on the street. And I can't speak, and this is no slam in the face uh, towards Mr. McDonald. I don't know what they do in Marion. In the city of Newark, our police captains are not going to be answering calls for service. They have administrative duties to do. Are there any other questions up here? Mr. Madam White? Chair, um, Chief, can, we're, we're throwing around this number of um, 70 sworn officers. Can you tell how many are patrol officers? As of today, with 69 sworn officers, the Patrol Bureau has seven sergeants and 42 sworn officers. The Detective Bureau has one sergeant and, of course, the captain. Ten detectives who are sworn officers. Ten. Support Bureau has two sergeants along with the captain, one officer, those are all sworn, and the Administrative Bureau has a captain, a sergeant, and a civilian employee. So if you take away the chief, four captains, and 11 sergeants, that's 16 people. We have 69 sworn officers total. That's 53 that are either detective or police officer rank. And that's what we call the boots on the street. Chief Sarr. Or the badge on the Can street. Can I ask that, could you e email that, those numbers to the members of City Council? Absolutely. Sure. I mean, I think that would be beneficial. Absolutely. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any other questions of City Council members? Any questions of the audience? <coughs> okay, we have a motion on the floor by Mr. Grove, a second by Mr. Marmy to accept this proposal. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion passes four to one. This will go on to city council. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break before the safety committee meets. Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting of New York City Council Safety Committee to order. Uh, members we have present tonight are Mrs. Floyd, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Guthrie, myself, and uh, Mr. Rath. Uh, first, I would like to give uh, Mr. Rath an opportunity to explain his proposal. Thank you. The main reason I brought this proposal forward is because of what you see here. Uh, we have a council chambers that are absolutely filled with citizens of Newark that want to hear their voice, or uh, uh, maybe they do want to hear their voice, but <laughs> they want to hear their voice, they want their voice to be heard, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so I, I did this mainly to give them an opportunity to have their voice be heard. Uh, whether I believe in eliminating the breed specific legislation or not uh, is pretty much irrelevant. I do believe in it, just to let you know that. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, is I was voted uh, as a council member to represent the citizens of Newark. The citizens of Newark are only overwhelmingly here in the room asking to be represented. Uh, so that's why I brought this forward. The uh, main gist of the legislation is pretty simple at this point. Uh, we have some verbiage in our, in our ordinances that uh, treat dangerous dogs and vicious dogs differently than normal dogs. And there is, because of the definition, there is a difference between a dangerous dog and a vicious dog. The rules that they have to follow are, are different. A vicious dog follows more stringent rules. Because of the way our ordinance is written, a pit bull 
for whatever breed that happens to be, uh, the day it's born is labeled as a vicious dog. What I am proposing is no change to the way we treat dangerous dogs at this time, and no change to the way we treat vicious dogs at this time, but that we treat dogs as dangerous or vicious based solely on their actions and not on their breed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... Yeah. Okay. So that's what I'm proposing today. I say at this time because I certainly would like to have our ordinance looked at uh, and gone over and, our, and there are some other changes that I'd like to make in the future as well. I'll tell you that I have a philosophy that, that um, we shouldn't have vicious dogs in our community. It, it's just that simple. If a dog viciously attacks somebody, I don't think that that dog should be allowed to stay within our community. Quite honestly, I really don't want to see that dog have an opportunity to bite somebody in any other's community either. Um, so we can address some of those issues in the future, but today's legislation has nothing to do with that. I also have gone on record in the past, uh, and I will continue in the future, that uh, if the owner of an animal allows that animal to viciously attack somebody, I want that owner held more seriously accountable as well. Um, I, I, just, I just think we need to throw the owner under the bus as well. Uh, and that's something I hope to address in the future and something I've tried to address in the past. Um, and we've, we have made some baby steps of progress towards that, uh, but that again is not what we're talking about tonight. We're also not talking about any personnel or any, any positions or anything like that. Tonight, what I've introduced is simply legislation that will eliminate labeling a dog as vicious based on its breed. Thank you, Mr. Rath. Um, next, I would like to invite uh, Chief Sarver up if he's here. Um, I've invited him to the meeting here tonight. Um, I've asked him to clarify uh, when an animal is deemed exotic versus uh, when it's deemed vicious in enforcement. Um, there's been confusion about that and some other enforcement issues. Um, so I just wanted to give him a chance to uh, clear that up. And thank you for being here, Chief Sarver. Thank you for asking me. The um, couple of the emails we've exchanged or that have gone through the safety director to me is that some people are, why are my dog, why is my dog being listed as an exotic animal? The section of the codified ordinances for Newark, uh, section 618-22, covers exotic and restricted animals. There's a whole host of prohibited animals to include lions and tigers and bears, jaguars, <laughs> oh my, monkeys, wolves, even possums. Those are flat out restricted. You can't have them, or they're prohibited. Once a dog has been deemed dangerous or vicious, it also falls into 618.22 in terms of reporting, insurance, and stuff. So. If our animal control officer, through his investigation, has deemed a dog to be dangerous or vicious, it does fall under this section. But the section B part, which deals with restricted animals, so in no shape, form, or fashion are we trying to say that any dog labeled as dangerous or vicious is now an exotic animal. Okay. It's just a, it's just in the same section. Okay, so a pit bull isn't just labeled exotic for any reason? No. Okay. I just had a couple uh, other quick questions. I, I was just wondering from your, from your perspective, have there been any aspects of the current law that have been challenging to enforce, and do you have any personal ideas on how we can improve that? The hardest part for our animal control officer enforcing a dangerous dog ordinance is compliance. We've got roughly 150 dogs that have been defined as either dangerous or vicious, which falls under certain categories. Insurance, chips, muzzles, restricted fences, and all that kind of stuff. Because when he cites them and they become a vicious dog, and, and please, Mr. Sasson, if I get this wrong, help me. Once a dog is deemed to be vicious or, or dangerous, and they register their dog, they now registered for a one-year period. So 150 dog owners throughout the entire course of a year have to renew their insurance, 
their licensing and all that stuff. And Toby spends a great deal of his time checking to see if somebody does have up-to-date insurance. One of the things that we're going to ask this committee to do, if any legislation is changed, is it, and we're more than happy to sit down with the law director and do some wording, we'd like to see the all the restrictions for licensing and, and of dangerous and vicious dogs to fall under pretty much the same thing, just like dog licensing does. That by January 31st, you have to have all this stuff in compliance. Toby can make sure then that all that stuff is done, and the rest of the year he doesn't worry about that until a new dog or another dog is now deemed vicious or dangerous. And then, again, working with the legislature or working with the law director, there'd be some kind of a prorated thing. It's July. You're going to have to pay six months now, and in January you'll kick in with everybody else. That's one piece that Toby Wills really spends a great deal of time on. It's an administrative function versus, as, as I uh, sarcastically say, dog catching or dog being a dog catcher. So that's one of the things that we would like to, if any legislation has changed at all, and if nothing's changed, if this committee and the full council decides not to change a single thing, we would still like somewhere down the road to get this added into the legislation for the reporting purposes. The other stuff as far as just the actual enforcement, Toby Wills is very good at what he does. And because of that, people get upset. If your dog is not in compliance and Toby holds you accountable, you as a citizen aren't happy. You have to pay insurance. You have to get the muzzle on your dog. You have to get it chipped. You have to do a lot of things. But Toby's following the legislation that this council created. If council says a pit bull or a dog that has bit somebody is now a dangerous or vicious dog, that's his job, to bring you into compliance. It's like having an auto accident. Nobody wants to get their ticket for running a red light, but you ran the red light. So we give you the ticket, and you're not happy about it. But we're trying to bring you back into compliance. We're trying to change your behavior. Okay. Um, I just had a couple other quick questions. Um, in your opinion, do you think the current law cost your department any unnecessary time or money to enforce? Um, that's a very difficult question to ask. Okay. The, um, Toby does so much in the world of dogs and cats and, and any other kind. I mean, we've, we've had exo exotic animals that he's had to deal with. How much of his job is tied into regulating the pit bulls and, and dangerous and vicious dog, I'm going to say that most of it is tied down to that administrative part, making sure that people are complying. He gets calls every day to investigate dogs, and you know, I'm here to tell you that a pit bulls population in Licking County in the city of Newark is a small percentage. But when we deal with dangerous or vicious dogs, those seem to be the ones that are, are causing him to have to do the enforcement. He's got German Shepherds and Great Danes and probably Poodles and everything else that bite people. And he holds them accountable the same way he would a pit bull owner. Please keep in mind that this council decided that a pit bull is a dangerous or vicious dog if it bites somebody. Toby Wills did not create that. He is doing his job and that's enforcing the law. Okay. Uh, sorry, you have a list of questions. I said one more I was going to ask. Um, lastly, if uh, the pit bull regulations were repealed, do you foresee that creating any difficulties for your department in any way? It's not going to create difficulty for my department. What I'll share with you, and, and I'm going to go out on a limb for a minute and say this is Steve Sarver talking to you and not your police chief. Okay? If my standard poodle gets upset with you and snaps at you, He's probably going to bite you one time and run. If dogs that we deem the pit bulls, who have the stronger jaws and so forth, when they bite you, they bite you. And oftentimes they hang on and they have to be beaten off. Is it going to create any more work for my officers? No. Is it going to create some more fear for the residents of Newark? Perhaps. Uh, I firmly believe that it's the duty of this council to enact the laws, yeah. and it's the duty of our police department to enforce them. Yeah. What you choose to appeal or what you choose to keep in place is your decision. Thank you. Mr. Rath. Chief, thanks for coming tonight. I appreciate your kidding this evening and, and sharing with us. Um, you said that, that Toby spends a great deal of his time yeah. dealing with administrative issues 
based on bringing people back into compliance or bring, keeping people in compliance uh, based on their dog being labeled as vicious. Uh, and, and I've heard the same thing about the, the different dates, that it, and that's something that I would like to introduce in the future, and I think that makes absolute sense mm -hmm. to be able to prorate it and, and then be, have, have everybody uh, expire at the same time. Right. It just makes things so much easier. Um, but let me ask you a question. If Toby had less administrative duties and more dog catching duties, as you put it, would that allow to Toby to be more effective in keeping the community safe? I'm going to answer your question, but let me go around in a roundabout way. If pit bulls aren't deemed as dangerous, and the pit bull hasn't be uh, bitten anybody, then that's less dogs, less dog owners, that Toby has to ensure come into compliance. That gives him time to do other duties. What we have found is that there's about 150 dogs that have been deemed dangerous or vicious in the city of Newark. Some are pit bulls and some aren't. So by doing away with the breed specific designation for pit bulls, it's going to eliminate some of the dogs that have to be licensed and all the other stuff to go with it. We still have 150 other dogs that have actually bitten somebody. So yes, it's going to reduce his administrative duties. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you that, that in dealing with the dangerous versus vicious, and there is a distinct distinction between the two of them. Um, the fact that we have 150 in the city of Newark is appalling to me. We need to do something about that. Uh, we need to do something about reducing the number of bites and the number of vicious dogs that we have in Newark that are actually attacking people. Uh, you also said that with a pit bull bite you, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I am not even going to debate that issue. I have never been bitten by a pit bull, and I pray to God that that stays, I can make that statement that they have not. Because uh, I guarantee it'll hurt. But uh, do you think the same is, is true for a lot lower of German Shepherd or mm -hmm. uh, a Dover and Pincher? Or, um, uh, I know there's a couple of, that, a friend of mine that owns two, I don't know what they're called, but they're great big, huge white dogs. Uh, pardon? Great Pyrenees? Yes. They, great Pyrenees, yeah. There's One no. of which is not very friendly, and I get nervous every time I go over there. <laughs> I, I, I mean, when they, can, can they not do the same amount of damage that a pit bull could do? Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to say right up front, I'm certainly not an expert in that field. What I'm going to share with you in my 40-something years of policing is most of these dogs, although they can do a severe, a German Shepherd canine teeth are about that, they can literally go through your arm. But they typically will bite you and release. Pit bulls bite you and hold on. And as the human tries to pull away, it causes more tearing and more ripping of the skin and so forth. That's all I'm saying in terms of a pit bull. Um, police use German Shepherds for a reason, because they have big teeth. And if we need you to be bitten by a dog, we want that dog to bite you. That's the whole message. If you don't comply with us, he will bite you. The, the pit bull, uh, if they're bred, I shouldn't say bred, in their breed, the tendency is that they will hold on and not let go until... Oftentimes, an owner can't even get them to release without literally the dog upside the head. And I am not, not here to say every pit bull is that way. I'll be the first to admit that there are great pit bulls in this world. When they do do damage, that's when it's serious. Yeah, I'll, I'll also be the first to admit that, that when that pit bull bites and does that damage, I want them out of our town. It's up to council with the legislation. And, and, that, and that's for future legislation. Mr. Guthrie, do you have a question? You know, um, uh, Chief, one of the concerns that uh, we've heard in, um, some, from folks with some of the emails has been regarding the, um, uh, uh, the timetable. Um, is this something that you folks have reviewed? Uh, is there something uh, wrong with the legislation that, that uh, provides owners with inadequate time uh, to register their dogs, inadequate time to, um, uh, you know, put their dogs through the AKC uh, Good Citizen Program. Um, uh, are there, are, 
when it comes to the timetables, are there areas that we could make improvements? I'd have to sit down with the law director's office, Mr. Guthrie, to really look at that. Looking at the legislation that once Toby has put you on notice that your dog's either dangerous dog, vicious dog, or in his opinion, he believes it's a pit bull, you have a certain amount of days to do everything you're supposed to do. Toby would be the first one to tell you if he was here. If he gives you 30 days and 30 days you're not in compliance, he gets back in touch with you and kind of points that finger and says, I told you 30 days. And then he'll give them, depending on, this is where we talk about discretion, depending on the circumstances and why I wasn't able to get over there, he may give somebody 10 days, he may give somebody 15, he may give somebody 30, depending on the circumstances. That's his discretion. The law is very clear that when you're put on notice that your dog fits that category, you have X amount of days to do it. And sometimes that involves getting costly insurance, getting a structure built at your home that maybe you can't afford, and you don't go in compliance quite as soon as what the law says. I use that word discretion because we do it a lot in police work. When you run a red light, it's not automatic that you're getting a ticket. A whole host of things come into play. Did you acknowledge that you ran the red light? Do you have a good driving record? Do you have insurance? Were you polite with a police officer? Did you not almost wipe out a van with six kids in it? A lot of things come into play. With Toby, it's not cut and clear like that. The legislation says if your dog has been deemed vicious or dangerous or is a pit bull, you will do this. Toby can't say, that's ah, okay, I'm going to let you go this time. You don't have to get the structure. That's his job. And that's why he gets a lot of resentment from the community because he's forcing them to do something that they don't feel they have to do. They have to do it because legislation says they have to do it. This council approved that. Uh, Director Sasson, could you uh, speak to the timetable issue at all? I mean, if, if a, a pit bull owner wanted to uh, apply for the good citizenship test, did they have adequate time to do that before uh, something's enforced on them by, say, an, an animal control officer? Or Well, that goes back to the issue of discretion that the chief okay. was talking about. If, you're, the, the, if your initial question was the time frame for coming into compliance, uh -huh. Um, that's completely controlled by the issue of discretion. Um, if, if your question is the timetable for redeeming a dog after a dog has been seized, vicious or otherwise, for being out of compliance, that's a, that timetable is established by the Ohio Revised Code. Okay. Um, but the timetable for allowing a dog owner to come into compliance um, rests solely on the discretion of the officer and in part that I think our experience has been is uh, a direct correlation to the degree of good faith being exerted by the dog owner. Okay. Yeah. I, my issue was I just wanted to make sure everyone who wanted to take the good citizenship test had the ability to before any action was taken against them. That's what I was looking for. May I make a small comment about yeah. that? Yeah. Again, this council changed the legislation to allow a dog that's been deemed, a pit bull that's been deemed dangerous, strictly because of its breed, to go through the Good Citizen program. We're having very few of those, very few, and I can't give you an exact number. Three. The other issue, three, three, the other issue that we've come is that people believe that they can take their dog through, let's just say, a 10-week program, and the dog finishes the program, passes the program, and they're coming in and saying, here's my certificate. The AKC administers the, uh, good, the good dog, um, good, citizen. good citizen dog, or show. They have to go to a class, plus they have to get that certificate. Mm -hmm. And they're, uh, whatever, a couple of people other than your opinion, I just got to go to the class. No, you got to go to the class. But you also got to get the Good Citizenship Award. Thank you. Mr. Rast. Mr. Chairman, if I could just follow up on one issue there with sure. regard to the discretion. And you talk, you talk about enforcement of these provisions for a dog owner who is attempting to yeah. go through this exemption process mm -hmm. for the canine good citizen. Understand that there's a second layer of discretion as well, and that is with the prosecutors in my office that the case would be brought to them 
And if there was reason to believe that that dog owner was exercising good faith to in fact accomplish that, um, we would exercise discretion in our office as well before that charge would be filed. So there's that second layer of discretion as well. Okay. Would any proof have to be shown that they were in fact enrolled in a training program or is just... Absolutely. Okay. We're, we're not in the business of taking people's word for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any more questions for uh, Chief Sarver while he's here? Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time, Chief. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I just... Uh, I just had a quick question for Director Spurgeon, if I may. Um, I was just wondering if you had uh, any insight as to how our first responders and police and fire uh, feel about loosening the restrictions on pit bulls. Do you have any sense to that? I don't, Mr. Chair. Okay. I'm of the mind that, uh, as our chief has said, uh, I can't expand on what he said. We will enforce, to the best of our abilities, whatever laws this council passes. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, uh, Mr. Spurgeon. Uh, yeah, Mr. Guthrie. Bill. Bill um, um, I appreciate the fact uh, that, that uh, you know, you've stated pretty clearly that you will enforce the uh, laws that council passed, but one of the things that council, you know, because we're not the enforcers, so to speak, we don't, we don't know what the enforcement problems are. And as the enforcers, um, uh, you can tell us if you're seeing problems with the legislation and, uh, uh, and advise us as to whether or not uh, there is a fix that you think is needed. And I know that you folks have said that you're open um, uh, to modifications. Can you be in any way specific for us as to what what you think from an enforcement standpoint um, you would find um, uh, better than the current legislation? I could, Mark, but the Chief has already said it. There is a problem with this uh, verification throughout the year, if you will. If we could say, listen, there's one designated time of the year, just like your dog tag, yet to X date to get it done, that would be my recommendation. But other than that, you have no other. I, have, I don't think no I could. Other recommendations. That, no, no, I rest on the chief's Sorry. testimony. Did you want to speak to that? If, if I could. Yeah. Um, from our end of the enforcement process, I understand what the chief is saying with regard to the time and that uh, and the time spent on administrative duties. And I think that, quite honestly, that could be a fairly easy fix from a piece of legislation. From our standpoint of. Uh, prosecuting these offenses, we do not have any difficulty with the current language and the current structure of the vicious dog ordinance. There was some discussion at a previous committee um, about cases from Reynoldsburg that have been prosecuted here in uh, court, and my office prosecutes those cases from Reynoldsburg in Licking County. Reynoldsburg cases should be distinguished from Newark cases because Reynoldsburg, although they have a similar law, albeit an outright ban on pit bulls, they do not have in place an administrative appeals process for the dog owner to challenge administratively the designation from the animal control officer as vicious. Newark does. The Newark Police Department has an appeals process in place. Um, so we don't experience those same due process difficulties with prosecuting these offenses out of Newark that we do and have out of Reynoldsburg. Um, we don't find this ordinance to be any more confusing than any other law, which um, admittedly to many uh, lay people, a lot of the law is confusing. Um, and there are a lot of laws that are confusing. Uh, not to be glib, but speeding laws in the state of Ohio, quite honestly, can on occasion be um, a little confusing when you throw in issues of CDLs. Ohio's OVI laws are very complicated, very difficult for lay people to understand. Um, this law is certainly no more confusing or difficult to understand than any of those provisions. Um, so from that aspect of enforcement. We don't have any difficulties whatsoever with the current structure of the ordinance.
Okay. Uh, could you explain a little bit about the due process that animal owners currently have in Newark? Is that established by state law, or is a, is Newark have an additional law on top of that? We uh, this council passed an ordinance a year and a half ago at my request to incorporate the administrative appeal process that's set forth in the Ohio Revised Code and incorporate that into our ordinances so that if the animal control officer designates a dog to be vicious, that dog owner has an administrative appeals process, that due process right to go through the hearing officer to present evidence to establish that their dog is in fact not vicious. Whether that designation of vicious is based on uh, the animal control officer's uh, assessment of the dog's breed or because of the animal control officer's assessment of the dog's behavior. That's an administrative due process appeal through the police department, through Captain Connell, that Reynoldsburg did not have. The problem that the court had with the Reynoldsburg cases is that the first time that the dog owner who's being charged was somehow violating the vicious dog laws of the city of Reynoldsburg, the first time they had an opportunity to challenge that designation was after they had been charged with a crime and were forced into court to defend their liberties. That's not the case in Newark. There's that administrative appeal process that adds that layer of due process short of a criminal violation being filed. Okay. And how much time does an owner have in the city of Newark for that appeal process? Is it a window of like seven to ten days or? I believe it's ten days. Ten days, okay. Right. Mr. Rath, you want to make a comment? I know I want to ask Mr. Spurs for a question. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Guthrie's prompting in saying that, that you have the ear of, the, or of our first responders. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we ask you an opinion, um, it's kind of with the feedback from them in mind. Uh, and I guess I'm going to ask your opinion is, is uh, us doing a preemptive strike, so to speak, on labeling a dog that's deemed to be a pit bull as vicious preemptively prior to any attacks. Uh, do you think that that has had any effect on making those dogs or those breeds uh, safer in the city of North? Yeah, no, that's a very fair question. The data that I have, and I've presented a couple of folks on council with that, shows a consistent challenge in the community with this specific breed of pet. What I don't have is pre-BSL data. I, I think you can draw two conclusions from that, and I don't know that I could, I could debate either side. Uh, well, gee, if the problem stays the same, then what good is the law doing? Well, okay, but if you take the law away or reduce the restriction, if you will, if the numbers spike, well, then there you have it. So uh, all I can testify to this committee is that our numbers stay the same with, with these types of pets in our community. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion from the committee, comments, questions? Okay. Thank you, Director Spurgeon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so now I will give uh, members of the public an opportunity to speak. Uh, once again, this will not be a question and answer session with the committee. Um, and it's, it's not the appropriate venue for complaints about a specific public employee. Um, if there are any concerns in this regard, please fill out a complaint form. Um, I'll now invite members of the audience uh, to come to the lectern and give their comments uh, if they wish to do so. Please come up one at a time and uh, give your name and address for the record. My name is Ryan Stone. I'm at uh, 39 Link Street. I've um, lived in the city of Newark for nine years. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. Um, I was the one who originally came in the mid-December meeting and requested that the BSL language be repealed from the Newark ordinance. Um, in April of 2013, I believe the last time I was here I said 2012, but it's 2013, um, my dogs got out of my um, fenced-in yard. And um, I was at work. Um, I was called by a neighbor that the police were after them. The police never apprehended them. By the time I got home from work, I rushed home to make sure that they were put away. There was nobody around. I found my animals on the neighbor's porch cowering. Um, over the next few weeks, I worked with the ACO to get my whole um, situation in compliance. Um, I had a family emergency that happened in between, so I was given a little bit of time to um, make things right. 
Um, I had things right within the week of the incident, except for getting the um, license, which I was unaware that I needed. I picked up my um, pit mix from the Humane Society, and I was not made aware that um, I needed a special license in the city of Newark. Um, that's on me, okay? Um, it wasn't until two and a half months later that I actually got a citation for failure to confine a vicious animal. Um, and I took care of it. I, I went to court. Um, I um, got to go into the diversion program and um, got my record expunged. However, the um, incident for me as a citizen cost me um, $400. If my pit was not automatically labeled as vicious, I believe the cost would have been around $15 plus any additional court fees. Um, I do not believe it's fair under the law to um, charge a pit owner different than any other breed owner. This is why I've asked for the repeal, and I have read the proposed legislation, and it's exactly what I asked for. So I would appreciate if um, we get a yes vote to put it to the full council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Do you need my name and address? Yes, please. Tammy Mitchell, 26 East Channel Street. <clears throat> um, I was listening to some of the things that they were talking about, and what I don't understand is you're supposed to have time in between to get things ready. So, so much time? Well, I had that. I already told you. I already let my, do uh, my son's dog out. And... Anyway, I'm like nervous, I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, I had accidentally let my son's dog out of the yard. And so when Toby had got the dog and stuff, I mean, dog didn't do anything, but he had so much time to get the couple things that he didn't have. I mean, we had already had the fence, because my son does fencing. We had already had insurance and all that stuff. He had to get a chip. But the school, the AKC class, is only twice a year. So I don't see how you get, can get stuff done within like 30 days when it's only twice a year. But luckily, we had got her into the class, you know. And, but we didn't know anything about going to court or anything. And then all of a sudden, we get this letter in the mail that we had to go to court. Well, we both had separate court dates, and it's not even my dog, but anyway, I guess I was called a harborer. So he went to court, and what don't make sense is you say that they get a certain amount of time to get stuff done when he only had a couple things to do anyway, and he had it done. I mean, he had it done within like a week, but then the class had to wait for it, but by the time we went to court... She was already through the class. She graduated, and Mr. McKee said that she was the first one in Newark, Ohio, to ever get all the compliances done. So I don't understand why when we went to court, he got 10 days in jail, and with both of us together, we paid a 900-some dollar fine, which I still owe $266 because I'm poor. But anyway, and then... I got first degree misdemeanor on my record, and I've never had a record in my life. And my son got first degree misdemeanor on his record. And I just don't understand if these compliances were supposed to be done before you went to court, why did he get jail time and stuff? I mean, the dog didn't do nothing, didn't hurt nobody. And I just don't think it all makes sense. But th this has got to be changed. It's just not fair. Because, I mean... Who would ever think that you would go to jail because your dog got out of the yard? I mean, seriously, it just don't make sense. And then getting $900 in fines and a first-degree misdemeanor when I've never done a thing wrong in my life. It's just not fair. So that's all i got to say. Thank you. My name is Janae Stolfire and I live at 780 Cedar Run Road in Newark. Before I even read what I wrote tonight, I just want to say that personally, I just can't believe 
we feel like we have the right to choose how an animal is before we even know anything about that animal. So if pit bulls are on this, I think chows and all these other dogs should be listed this and having to be proven otherwise, you know, because it just, it's sad. It really is. It's sad that people are wrongly informed on how pit bulls are. And I've actually heard that tonight from leaders in our community. And I'm not saying they're wrong. It's just not necessarily correct. But um, as the people of our community push forward for uh, the elimination of the BSL from the NORC Code of Ordinance, I would like to take a moment to help some see why exactly we need this change. We already know that a variety of factors may affect a dog's tendency towards aggression such as early experience, socialization, training, reproductive status, and irresponsible owners. We also need to evaluate all aspects of the BSL such as labeling, not being cost effective, putting our safety second, and most importantly, a death sentence. Although the BSL was intended to improve community safety and comfort, these laws can ultimately cause hardship to responsible guardians of properly supervised, very friendly, well socialized dogs. Even though guardians of pit bulls and bully breeds of any type may have done nothing to endanger the public, they nevertheless may be required to choose between compliance with regulations or possible forfeiture of their beloved companion. These laws create a climate where it is nearly impossible for some residents to live with these breeds and it virtually ensures the destruction of otherwise adoptable dogs by our shelter. Because of our laws that classify all pit bulls as vicious and and imposes various requirements on their guardians, pit bull owners have great difficulty locating housing and obtaining homeowners or renters liability insurance. And our animal shelter enforces a pit bull non-adoption policy. The consequences have been and are currently disastrous. In addition, dogs outside a targeted breed may become collateral damage of a breed-specific law. Our shelter has limited space and must hold pit bulls during legal, legal proceedings, and during times they are lost and dumped. As a result, the shelter has euthanized otherwise adoptable dogs of many different breeds due to the lack of space. Perhaps the most harmful unintending consequence of breed-specific laws is their tendency to compromise rather than enhance public safety. As certain breeds are regulated, others are not. It must be considered that if we limit animal control resources, that are used to regulate and ban a certain breed of dog, the focus is shifted away from routine effective enforcement of laws that we have the best chance making our community safe, such as dog license laws, leash laws, animal fighting laws, anti-tethering laws, laws facilitating animal sterilization, and guardians of all breeds to control their pets. Guardians of regulated and banned breeds are being driven to live a criminal life when otherwise law-abiding citizens. Dogs are not being registered. No tags, no vet care. Neighbors and landlords are not being told about their, you know, people living next to them. They're being lied about the breed of dog. And dogs are euthanized, killed, and murdered, all because owners are afraid to pick them up from the pound because of consequences they might face. As a community, we cannot take a pit bull to the pound because it's a death sentence. After three days, they kill them if they're not picked up by the owner. It creates a major safety issue for companion animals and people because BSL simply does not work or help. It just unfairly targets responsible pet guardians and their pets. 
Providing education on care, training, and supervision of dogs, as well as laws that address licensing, spay and neutering, chaining, improper confinement, cruel treatment and abuse, at-large dogs, imposing civil and criminal liability um, on the guardians for their negligence and reckless behavior, and targeting problematic dogs and owners sooner than later. This is what needs to happen to make our community and animals safer, not BSL. Please vote to have breed specific legislation removed from our ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, you're not going to speak? My name is Terry Lyle, 294 Stair Road, Newark. The way the current BSL law is written, being a Vietnam veteran, pit bulls are one of the major PTSD service dogs sanctioned and approved by the VA. If I had PTSD bad enough that they gave me a service dog, I would be in violation of the law because it was a pit bull. It only cost roughly $30,000 to, to train one of those dogs. And yet it's going to be declared a vicious dog, a dangerous dog. That dog is probably more behaved than my boxer. And my boxer is so behaved, you don't even know she's there. And that, but it makes me a criminal, and it makes the dog a criminal, and yet it's already been through more training than even the AKC. But again, if I get a PTSD dog and it's a pit bull, it's deemed a vicious dog and that costs me a lot more money for a dog that's not going to do anything except protect me. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. The, the um, uh, you had indicated that your dog is trained before you receive it. Before you receive a dog, okay. And, and who provides that training? Is, the, uh, is the I don't know who the VA uses because I don't have one. I do have PTSD. Yes, it's not bad enough that I need a dog. Okay, but there is a program where the Veterans Administration provides this as a service yes. to veterans. They provide the dog, they provide the training, and then you also have to go through training with that dog too. But because, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Law Director, I think if there's a verifiable program that um, those types of you know, dogs that have been through that program should be exempt. I mean, is that something we can look at, Mr. Sasson? Um, yeah, and I'm familiar with the, the, the type of program that you're talking about here with Canine Companions, which is generally the, I, I believe it's actually Canine Companions, Inc. that does the training. Um, and, yeah, I'm not positive of that. I think it is, too. Um, so that'd be a, a, a fairly simple exception to write into the rule. Um, absolutely. Because, I mean, I personally, in, in numerous VA hospitals and clinics, I have seen pit bull service dogs in the clinics, and I've talked to some of their owners. So, it, but it is something that, again, as the current law reads, you're, you're in violation of the law, and you're forced to do things that you shouldn't have to do in order to get yourself in compliance. If I may interject, doesn't the current uh, law... Sir, could you come to the podium and give your... No, I'm making, I'm making, I'm and this more. is a question for Mr. Sasson. Um, doesn't the current law exempt service dogs from the vicious standing? You know, I was just looking at that myself, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure I know it exempts police dogs, but I don't think it exempts service dogs. Okay. I didn't, I didn't see it in there either. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Law. Do you have any more questions? Thank you. You know, Mr. Sasson said earlier that, that even speeding laws are confusing. Uh, and I can certainly see where this law would be even more confusing 
when we have an exemption for the canine good citizens test, we have an exemption for the service dog, and we have an exemption for black spots, and we have an exemption for that. <laughs> um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that if the veteran administration <laughs> thinks that this is a dog that's treatable, mm -hmm. that is good to put with somebody as a service dog who has PTSD, and if the state of Ohio has retracted their ruling and taken this dog off of the vicious dog list, I think we need to come in compliance with the state of Ohio as well. Um, and all of these people that are testifying who own dogs, own dogs that aren't attacking people. Yes. And I am all in favor of taking dogs that are attacking people and removing them from our community. And I'm sorry if this offends somebody, but I don't care if that's shipping them out, but I would much rather prefer they be euthanized. Because I don't care who they bite, in what community they live, I don't want them to bite again. It's that simple. But the dogs that are good pets, that are well behaved, that are represented in here by their owners, by all of these people here in council, I think ought to be treated as any other dog. It's that simple. I also think that with this much outcry from the community, um, that this is a, an issue that should be thought about, that should be debated, and, and I'm certainly willing to hear more testimony, uh, but I also think it's, a, it's an issue that should be decided on by all of council and not just a committee of five. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for that reason, I'll make a motion that we adopt this and move it on to full council. I'll second it. We have a uh, motion by Mr. Rath and a second by Mr. Johnson. Now before we go to a vote, we'd like to uh, let everyone in attendance continue to speak. So. Uh, Good evening. Uh, my name is Jennifer Peck, Peck and um, I live at 89 Flory Avenue. <clears throat> a few of the points that I wanted to make really quick is that, you know, we're, we're, we're talking... It's, this is the first city council meeting I've ever been to. I apologize for not supporting that, but um, I'm grateful that I live in the United States of America. I'm grateful that there's an American flag standing outside of this building. I'm grateful that all of you spend your time trying to defend what you believe in your hearts is right, true, and good. Um, you know, in World War II, a war that defended that flag, pit bulls were used as service dogs because of their intelligence, because of their stamina, and because of their force. And now we're trying to persecute them. We persecute them in Lincoln County. Um, I own a pit bull. I also own a German Shepherd, and I own a, um, a boxer. <clears throat> My situation is that I do have a privacy fence. It's eight foot tall. Um, I have the special locks. I have the beware of dog sign. My dog is chipped. My dog has its rabies shots. Um, you know... I was unaware of the fact that in the state of Ohio, I used to have a red nose pit and I lived in Knox County and I didn't have to carry insurance for him. Um, so when I got my dog, which all three of my dogs are rescue dogs, I was unaware of the fact that I had to get insurance. Um, I also have teenagers and they had a bonfire in the backyard and left our gate open. <clears throat> my pit bull is a rescue dog. He was born in a crack house in Columbus. They broke his tail. They burned him. They tried to fight him. And um, today, you know, he is, out of my three dogs, my most loving, my most affectionate. Um, he's a baby. And uh, I, I understand that with any animal, lion, tiger, bear, you know, alligator, uh, German shepherd, pit bull, Rottweiler, Chow Chow. Um, I think one of the gentlemen said that they had a poodle. Poodles used to be on the vicious list. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. But, um, anyways, my 30 pound um, dwarf dog from being around crack cocaine got out and was frolicking in my front yard. And the gentleman up the street from us who has an issue with my husband because he wouldn't do some electrical work for him for free called the dog warden. Now, I listed all the things that we have. I did not have the insurance. Our bank, because we own our home, our um, homeowner's insurance goes through our bank. Our insurance company dropped us. I had to refinance my house. 
had to get $300,000 worth of insurance on my home. Let me tell you, my home is worth probably 85000 Okay, so, you know, maybe it'll burn down and I can rebuild it a couple, four or five times. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> missed work. My husband missed work because now I had to go to court, got fined $470, had to a- apply for new insurance. Let me tell you, that took me three weeks to find somebody to cover us. I mean, and this is diligently calling, you know. I'm a law-abiding citizen. So is my husband. So are my children. So is everyone else in my family. Some of the members are in this, this proceeding tonight. Um, it is discouraging to me as an American citizen to have someone tell me that my dog is a vicious killer because of his breed. That is very improper. If my dog, and I, I, you can mark my words on this, tape it. If my dog got out and bit a child, bit another person, bit our mailman, bit our neighbor, bit one of you or your children, I would have my dog put down. I would have it put down. Just like if a man goes and commits a crime, we put him behind bars. We don't automatically take their life, but we do eradicate the situation. This is an easy, cut, dry thing. You know, this isn't... You know, we're not asking for an extra police officer. (laughs) We're asking that something that just makes plain black and white sense that you would do. That the trusted people of this council that we have elected would overturn this. Give it a year. Put that in the, the, whatever it's called, the bill. (laughs) You know, give it a year. See if it changes. See if people are getting mauled by our dogs. You know, we're, that's all we're asking for. Give us a chance. You know, I have to go to court again for the third time now in a week. When I've already been to court two other times, provided my insurance, provided everything the court asked me to do, and yet I have to go to court again. It's a little frustrating. It's, it, it <laughs> makes you a little upset. Over my 30-pound rescue little baby, I have videos, I have pictures, and I'm more than happy to share that. You can walk up into my house. Believe me, it'll be my German Shepherds you need to look out for. Because that's, that's what their breed is trained to do. She's very obedient. She's not going to bite you, but she's going to let you know. My pit bull is going to lick you and try to flip over on you and flop its head to the side and get its belly petted. Are there pit bulls that are vicious killers? There really are. It's very sad that people take defenseless, helpless animals and teach them to kill to make money. You know what? We have teenage girls that are trafficked <laughs> to make money. We, have bigger, we do have bigger issues, but this is a pretty important one. It affects my family. It affects everybody in this, in this chamber tonight. You know? Thank you for your time. Overturn this bill. Tim Reed, 517 Jackson Boulevard. How you doing? Sure. Um, I just want to take a second to, um, I, have a du- I feel I have a duty to um, not only represent uh, uh, fellow uh, uh, pit bull owners, but also the breed, but also um, I want to try to, to, to uh, bridge the gap a little bit here too. I also have a duty to a man um, who I know, knew as, um, be, as having a vast amount of integrity, being a very fair person. And uh, he also called himself grandfather to my pit bull Bruno, and that was former councilman, uh, the late Ed Haldeshell. Um He's not he's not able to be here. Of course, um, you know it would have been nice if we could have got this going sooner. But I can tell you that um, it's my duty to at least let everybody here know that he's very passionate about this. And and um, so we uh, we're not on two black and white sides of this. It's um, we really need to pay attention to, uh, to to what everybody here is saying and the fairness of, of, of what's going on. Um, because the, the money these people are talking about, you know, we as well are complete compliance. And we don't want anybody owning pit bulls in our community that, that that's not going to be responsible with them. We, as pit bull owners, we don't want that to happen. Um, so we're, we're on your side with that. Um, and but to hear the, the amounts of money that these people are being told and, and, and all the the hardships, imagine if they would have put half the money they spent in court fines, just take half of that and put it towards um, 
you know, upgrading their, their properties. But now they've got to start from ground zero with um, refinancing homes and stuff like that. You know what kind of a, what kind of dog pen you could build for three hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> wow. But um, anyway. Um, Ed would would have wanted me to to um, he's he's uh, he, those of you who know him know that he's, that that he's uh, he doesn't say what he doesn't doesn't say if he doesn't mean it and he's an honest guy and he's um, and during the, uh, the the later part of his life Bruno kept him company was a friend to him and really brightened his days and uh, that was very important in our family so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Colonel McLean. My address is 980 Village Green Court, living in Newark. Been here all my life. Um, I am no longer a pit bull owner um, due to the fact back in 2009, um, a friend of mine had to give his dog away because of where he moved to. They were not allowed to have them because of being on the vicious list. I took him in. He was three years old, the biggest baby you ever seen. He was a red nosed pip. Um, I had also gotten a puppy that was mixed. I don't know what he was mixed of. He was just a cute little thing. Um, one day I came home. My puppy was in the pen. He used the bathroom. I took him outside, tied him up to my deck, which we had a very big yard. Um, went back inside, got the cleaning stuff. Um, I had a daughter at the time that was two, put her down to sleep. The dog was outside, I don't know, maybe a half hour at the most. Um, came back downstairs. A friend came in and said that the dog warden was outside and wanted to speak to me. So I went outside. Um, he told me that he had gotten a call that my dog had been outside for hours, which I had just gotten home, so I don't see how my dog was outside for hours. Um, told him, I was like, as you can see, I'm trying to clean out the cage. You know, he went to the bathroom, I have to clean the cage out. Well, he heard my other dog inside barking. Um, he told me he was going to have to take my pup because he said it was a pit. And I'm like, I don't know what kind it is because I just got it for like a week ago. I don't know what it is. You can tell it, it didn't even resemble a pit. So he took him. He told me I had to go inside and get my dog, the other dog and bring him out. And I'm like, why? He's not doing anything. He's inside. He's barking because he hears you out here. He says, well, if you don't do that, then you're going to go to jail. I'm like, okay. I'm pregnant at the time. I got a two-year-old. I don't need to go to jail. So I go in. I get my dog. He goes right with the dog warden. Didn't give him no hassle or anything. Took both my dogs. Told me I had three days to come up with insurance, tags, rabies shots, and all that which I, at the time, wasn't even thinking. You know, I'm working, I'm a single mom. How am I going to afford all this in three days? Um, so since I could not comply with that, and I will be honest, I knew nothing about the law on pits. Never owned them. So um, they put him down, both of them, my pup and my uh, pit. And um, about a month and a half later, I got... Um, papers in the mail that I had to go to court. I didn't understand why you put my dogs down. I didn't see how I was going to get insurance, the shots, and tags, why they were in the pound. How could I do that? Um, got me an attorney, went to court. Even the judge even asked why you took the pup, because the pup didn't even resemble a pet. Um, they couldn't answer that. Um, so, you know, my daughter, two years old, still to this day, she's seven now, to this day talks about her tank. <laughs> That's what he called him, tank. They rolled around on the floor together. He let her ride around the house on him. You know, he was a good dog, never barked at anybody, <coughs> never had any complaints about him. Um, cost me $500, and I now have a criminal record because of that. And I don't think that's fair. There are people here that can't afford all of that stuff, but would love to have, you know, a dog as a pet. My kids right now want a pet, but because of that, the slaw, having to have all this insurance, having to have, you know, special tags, having to go through this course, that's a lot of money. But we would really like to have a pet because we've had one before, and it was a big baby. 
So I'm asking you, please rethink this law. Thank you. We're going to try this again. Um, Amanda Sayers, 422 Wellington Avenue. <clears throat> um, this is my son, Marcus Bush. Um, Marcus was born with Sakabashian and um, I was told he was blind when he was a year and a half old. My first instinct as a mother was to go out and get a, uh, you know, seeing eye dog. Um, well, they told me as he got older that would be something that we could look into. Um, that the dog would die before he was able to use it. So, um, a year ago, Marcus will be 13 the end of um, February. He has cerebral palsy. And um, a year ago, we really considered what kind of dog we wanted to get for Marcus. I looked into it. I called training, um, places that train animals, um, the dog pound on Thornwood Drive, the Rascal unit, really talk to different people and let them know that I considered a pit bull. And I didn't have one person deter me from that. They said I couldn't have asked for a smarter, more loyal um, dog to have with Marcus. Um, she's been with him a year now and she's amazing. Um, she is good with everybody. We have therapists that come into the home. Um, we probably have, we have a nurse every day, and she greets everybody with kisses and love, and there's never been. We live with two other dogs. She mothers all of them. We live with two chihuahuas. They bite at her, and she jumps away from them. She would never, and as an owner, and Marcus, you know, I would just be fair. Be fair to each and an individual dog as you would, you know, an individual person, period. That's all I'm asking. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. My name is Savannah Barsati. I live at 507 Catalina Drive in Newark. Um, I don't have, it's real quick what I have to say. Everybody said pretty much everything. Um, but if you search on the internet anywhere, or if you go to the library and read in books, you will find. Pit bulls do not have any special physical mechanism or enzyme that allows them to lock their jaws. That is completely a myth. You can do any research on it you want. I have researched it extensively. So I just want that out there so that it's not being perpetuated and shared. That's all. Thank you. Would anyone else like to make a comment? Go ahead. This is very off. Sandra Spencer, 253 Park Trails Court. Um, this is very off the cuff, so I'm not prepared. But just from listening to what other people are saying, I think you can see that there are people, that the citizens of Newark are being burdened financially with the cost of, of um, owning one of these dogs. Um, when something happens, inadvertent accidents where a dog gets out, which... From the pound, you see that there are many strays. This can happen. If they happen to own a pit, it's very unfairly just on, on the, the um, punishment that these people are receiving. And just on that alone, the way that the law is, is worded is just not, um, is, I, I hate to say it's not fair, but it's not fair. And I, you know, you, you're here to represent the citizens of Newark and yes, I mean, I don't even own a pit bull. I'll be honest with you, never have. I would, but I don't. Um, so I'm not, I'm not an owner trying to advocate for my dog, but I'm just seeing black and white, it's just a very unfair law. I think every dog should be judged, as people say, on its actions, just like every person should be judged on its actions. It's just, as someone said, it's very simple, black and white, like that. And I understand that there's a tendency to want to protect the citizens of New York, but a lot of that is just a perpetuated myth of, you know, of course, the, you know, the papers aren't going to cover when a poodle bites a person, but if a pit bull bites a person, it's front page. And that's not, you know, and all those things lie in the back of people's heads because that's what they hear. But truly, um, if every dog was judged by its actions, it would be, everything would be very simple. Toby could concentrate on the dogs he needed to concentrate on. 
you know, the money, time of officers, AC, um, animal control officers, everybody could be uh, well appropriated that way. So, anyways, um, thank you for listening to everybody. Um, I, I think it's pretty black and white, I really do, and I think we need to step, you, you see the trend of what's going on. This is kind of old thinking, just, you know, Back when there were civil rights issues, there was old thinking, everybody thought they were doing what was right. We need to move forward. You know, look, Newark, or, you know, people think that, you know, we're a redneck city, that, you know, we need, you know, we're, we are acting like that by keeping these old laws. And we need to move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Alley Long 217 South Quinn. Uh, last Monday I did come up and speak to you guys. I do own a pit bull. Um, gorgeous dog. Big baby. Lap dog. Everything. He does have short term memory loss. He will not remember anybody within five minutes. He's <coughs> allergic to everything and anything. He can't eat nothing but certain kind of dog food. Now I'm here to support all of them too. These dogs aren't vicious. My three-year-old nephew, he can put food in his mouth and chew it up, and my pit bull will take it right out of his mouth. It might sound gross and all that, but he's a very clean dog, I swear. <laughs> he's very clean <laughs> and all that. Um, very gentle. Um, when he meets new people, he does get excited because, like I said, he don't remember. You can go away for five minutes, come back to see him, and he'll jump all over you and everything, re-greeting you because he don't remember who you are. But, I mean, I don't know how many of you guys received that video that I made. And they were these people's pit bulls. In the city limits of Newark, do those dogs honestly look vicious or dangerous to you guys? That's what you guys should be thinking. I mean, like I said, anybody can walk up to my pit bull, break into my house. The one you got to worry about is my chow. She's the one who will bite you. And everything, my pit bull, he'll jump on you, want you to pet him, rub his stomach, let him outside for crying out loud, and he'll be happy. He'll be content in everything, but let's stop it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nikki Arter, and I live at 13142 Job's Road, Newark. And I was asked by a postal worker, a letter carrier, to read this for her. Um, her name is Rita Hupp, and this is what she has to say. As a letter carrier, this is the way I see the dog issue in Newark. Please keep in mind, I do not represent all carriers, but I am certain that I am not the only one who feels this way. One certain breed of dog is not the problem. The problem is irresponsible dog owners and an extremely poor dog warden. The worst bite I have ever received was from a beagle. It was not a vicious dog out terrorizing people, just didn't like me on her turf and got out unexpectedly. It happens with all breeds. In this case, the owner did everything he was told and the issue was taken care of, not by killing the dog. As a letter carrier, I have long given up depending on the dog warden. You call when a dog is a problem? Sometimes stop delivering an entire area to be safe and have to leave a voicemail which does not receive a call back. This means we didn't don't know if the dog is back home, if the owner was contacted or what. We, the letter carriers, can usually tell the dog warden where the dog lives and a lot of times it's the name, but the owners are not notified that their dog has caused problems. As a letter carrier, I have had issues of varying degrees with dogs of all sizes and breeds. Some of my best canine pals have been rots, pits, and boxers. I am a dog owner. Any dog has the potential to bite whatever the size or breed or color for that matter. I urge council to address the bigger issues in this ordeal and fix it to protect both man and beast. Thank you, Rita Hupp. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, the, um, it was either the um, safety director or the police chief that mentioned that we don't have a high percentage of pit bulls in Newark. I took the last couple of weeks of last year to... I'm sorry, before you continue, could you give us your name one more time? Okay, I'm, I'm Ryan Stone, 39 Wing Street. Thank you. Okay. Um, the last couple of weeks of 2014, I took the time to go through the um, county search engine for tags. And I was just putting one number after another. Um, I found out we have 40,000 dogs tagged in Licking County, okay? Um, we have more dogs than that in Licking County. Um, 
I specifically was looking for the addresses of those in Newark. I can't say it was the city of Newark. I know there's also a township of Newark. So, but the ones that were listed as Newark. I went through one-fifth of the tags, which is approximately 2,000 tags. Um, number one breed is Labrador. Number two breed is Beagle. And the number three breed is Mixed. Okay, so from the records, we may not have a large percentage of pit bulls, but I wonder how many of those are hidden in the mixed breed. Um, and how many of those are mislabeled? Because there's no verification of your breed. You just fill that out and say whatever breed you want. So I don't think that the facts attribute that we have a very small percentage of pits. I think there's a lot of pits out there that just aren't registered appropriately out of fear of being prosecuted for having a pit. Kenneth Long, 217 South Quinton Street. Um, what I'd like to say is I don't believe that this law is a just and fair law. Uh, I'm not for and I'm not against, but I think everybody should be treated equally and everybody should be treated fair. We live in America where we are allowed freedom of speech and freedom to express ourselves. Um, all these people in this audience are owners of pit bulls. And I feel that the law that we have discriminates against pit bull owners. Anybody knows any dog can bite anybody. Just like your, we have our seatbelt law. They don't want to tell you that they've unbuckled a live person in an auto accident. What they want to tell you is they unbuckled, a, or they found someone dead because they didn't wear their seatbelt. The news media blows everything way out of proportion sometimes. We have dogs that bite, and invariably, when it's a pit bull, it's spread all over and blown way out of proportion. Whereas you heard tonight, mail carriers are getting bit by little dogs. We had the police chief who said that they use German Shepherds. There's a reason why they use German Shepherds as police dogs. But I feel that any dog can be trained to be uh, vicious. They can, train, they can be trained to bite. It all is in the owner of that dog and how it is raised. And I feel that if we're going to have a law in the city of Newark, that it should be black and white, and it should be clear cut, and it should not discriminate against the owner or the breed. That if we're going to have that law, it should be the fines and the punishment should be no matter what that breed of dog is. The other thing is if you go to the library and you look up in the encyclopedia, you look up dog books, nowhere does it say, and if you'd ask anybody in this audience or a little child, what is an exotic animal? The first thing to mind is not going to come a dog or a pit bull. So where this law is classifying and, and turning and saying that, you know, it's an exotic animal is, is you know, ridiculous. Well, to answer your question, I have to go to court. I'm being I'm not being charged. My wife is being charged with having an exotic animal. Now, I'm not gonna badge because he's not here, but the law enforcement officer that Licking County has has a personal experience with the breed pit bulls. He invariably seems to single out people and owners of this breed because of this. Yes, I understand, sir, uh, but the complaints about a specific, specific public employee, this isn't the, the venue to do that. We really can't do anything about that up here. I understand. I'm just, I'm just letting you make that aware because when you all sit in your chamber and your council and you debate this issue, I believe you need to know all of the facts, not just some of them. Mm. You know. Mr. Rath? Um. Just to, the, just to address the issue on the exotic, we heard testimony about this earlier from the chief, and, and I have the law here in front of me. I'm not sure who's involved in writing it. Um, but the, the pit bulls aren't ruled as exotic. They're, there is a stipulation in the, in, the rule, in the law that says exotic and restricted. The fowls under the same number. A vicious dog is a restricted animal, but not an exotic animal. And that's why it's you hear them mention 
exotic or restricted. And, and the fact is, is that it's classified as restricted, not exotic. Now, I know this isn't a question or answer, but my question to that is, is that why on the summons on the court papers does it list and have that stated that that is the charge of exotic? Yeah, I mean, every, everybody in this room at one time or another, you've heard. And the other thing I have to say, just real brief, is punishments and fines, I'm not here to argue. And I believe if you break the law, yeah, there are certain consequences. But to put owners in jail for 10 days, 30 days, because of their abiding by the law and they don't have one or two things, just to me is, is ridiculous when I think we should fo be focusing more on drug dealers and crime and that and punishing those people, not owners of dogs. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad everybody's out here. I, I see one more person coming to the podium and bringing her service dog with her. I guess I'll let her speak before I say anything else after that. But I want to say something when she's done. Um, but of, the, of everybody in the group, is there anybody here that has anything dramatically different to say other than what's already been said? Okay, if I could speak or when she's done, I'll give her an opportunity. But sure. Yeah. I, I do actually have a little, a little different. Uh, my name is Jessica Lyon. I'm actually not from Newark. Um, I'm from Knox County. Um, you asked though earlier, I, I heard mention um, about like statistics about before BSL laws or, and if that would change, you know, if taking away BSL will change or make the community any more dangerous. And just coming from a community that um, Knox County did recently have a BSL law, not as strict as your guys' is. <laughs> um, but, but there was, you, we had to have insurance, um, the animals had to be muzzled and that. Um, of course, being a service dog, I don't really have to apply. Um, but, but just coming from that, I think BSL, it, it makes people afraid to come up and, and to socialize these breeds that definitely need socialized. So, you know, when you say that there's not that many pit bulls in Licking County, that's a joke. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's dogs that people hide because they're too afraid. To, to mention that their dog is what it is, and that's sad, considering these are really great dogs, especially when you get socialized and exercised. Uh, of course, I'm a big spay and neuter person. <laughs> that's huge. But, I mean, very specific legislation is just, it's, it just doesn't make sense anymore. I mean, there's, there's no reason for, you know, one dog to, just because of the breed, to be labeled as such as a vicious animal, and obviously that's not true. Um, this dog is, she makes my life livable. <laughs> and, you know, she was a rescue. She came from a bad situation. Um, I've, I work with uh, lots of shelters around the county, or Ohio, I'm sorry, Richland, um, Wayne County, Holmes County, and I was at Knox since I was 15. I've seen a lot of dogs. <laughs> and uh, we've, I mean, a lot of dogs. <laughs> and. We've never really had issues with pit bulls. I mean, of course, they can be vicious. Of course, they're very strong animals. And they, they should be owned by people who are willing to step up to the plate. And I think another um, guy here, he said, the majority of pit bull owners, are, they want to be responsible. We want to make, make people look at our dogs and you know, really want to come see them. I guess, sorry, I'm kind of nervous. But, uh, you know, these are awesome dogs. They don't deserve this. And I think if you guys, you know, even just try it out, just get rid of BSL and just see, you'll see. I mean, the amount of people that will be okay with coming forward and saying that their dog is what it is, you'll notice a big difference. Once they get socialized, and that's the biggest thing. I think the fear, when the fear is gone of owning them, it will help the the dogs in this area because they're not going to be tied up in a backyard or locked in a house all day. So, just yeah. Yes, uh, I'll yield to Mrs. Floyd before I.
speak. Okay, you yeah. got mine. I just want to say I I will vote to move this on to full council. I do want the audience to realize that the next next week is uh, regular council where we'll vote on other things. The following week will be another committee meeting which won't have this issue there. So February 16th is when the vote will actually take place. It's, it's 17. It is the 17th. And is okay. community allowed to go to that meeting? Yeah, that's a public meeting. Yeah, council meetings are public meetings. Um, I do want to mention that as a you know as somebody who knew I was going to vote on this tonight as well as you know in three weeks, um, I just want you to be aware that you know um, not everybody agrees with you. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people, and a lot of people have their own stories to tell one way or the other. Uh, we've all read tons of emails, yours and everybody else's, from here and from all over the state. Um, I don't know how the vote's going to go in three weeks. I would just say to you, if, if it does not pass in three weeks, because I know there's a lot of feeling. I'm a retired civics teacher, so I'm all in favor of citizen involvement. My suggestion to you would be to get up an initiative petition that's the way citizens can make laws. Um, you have to get a number of signatures. You need to talk to the Board of Elections and get enough signatures. You need to get a lot more than what it tells you to, just to be sure they're all valid signatures, by Newark voters, and then you, in effect, would sell your story to the Newark voters. Um, sometimes, you know, I know there are 10 of us voting, but there are a number of other citizens who have, you know, a wide variety of views, and I've made it a point to try to talk to all kinds of people, to, you know, as many people, everybody I see who I know lives in Newark, I say, okay, what's, what's your viewpoint on this? Because we have discussed it many, many times now, and it is something that affects the entire community. So uh, that's a suggestion. I don't know how the vote's going to go in three weeks, so uh, we'll find out in three weeks, I guess. So with that, thank you. Mr. Rath. Thank you. I appreciate those comments, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak before I know. I, I said what I had to say, and yeah, yeah, appreciate that. You know, we've listened to people talk for the last hour and a half now. Um, pretty much all had the same story, pretty much uh, have all had the same experiences. We've had such an outcry of uh, community support for changing this legislation. Uh, we really haven't heard anything to the detriment of it. Um, it uh, we could listen to this all night long. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is we need to go out and talk to the rest of the people in the community as well, such as what Carol Floyd just mentioned, and, and find out how everybody else feels about this. Uh, but if we if we continue this on tonight, we could honestly be here till midnight till we hear these questions uh, and hear this testimony. Uh, and, and quite honestly, I, I think we've made enough, heard enough, to make a decision as to whether to pass this on to full council or not. Uh, so with that being said, I'll call the question. Okay, so uh, we'll vote on the question. Yep. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Okay. All well, those we're calling on the question to bring it, bring it up. Yes. Yeah. So now we'll call the votes. Uh, I'm going to vote no because I would like to have uh, said something. But go ahead. Okay. So it passes four one. So all those in favor of passing this on the full council, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? This will be passed on the full council, and that concludes our meeting for the night. Thank you very much.